Hello, everyone. I'm Edward Ennenfull, the Editor-in-Chief of British Vogue. I'm here today to discuss a topic that's very close to my heart, activism and also education and community service. One of the more positive aspects of the last few years for me has been seeing how in the face of injustice, activism has re-emerged from the margins and taken hold of the mainstream. In the wake of the Black Lives Matter protests in June, as I thought about what would be an appropriate response for British Vogue, I came back to the idea of activism. And that's why I have filled the pages of the September 2020 issue of the magazine with inspirational campaigners who have used their platforms to effect positive change in their industries. To continue these vital conversations, I am thrilled today to welcome a selection of phenomenal cultural leaders to a wide ranging discussion that will touch on everything from social justice to allyship. I am pleased to welcome Virgil Abloh, Patrice Collars, Tamika Mallory, Janet Mark, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, Yara Shahidi, and Jesse Williams to British Folks Roundtable, moderated by my good friend Darnell Strong. Darnell is the head of the Culture and Leadership Division at United Talent Agency. Thank you, Edward, uh, and thank you, British Vogue, for hosting this you know, very important conversation. Before we, we dive in, I just want to take a moment to recognize my dear friend, Edward Ininfol. You know, Over the last three years, he's been editor-in-chief of British Vogue. He's really transformed the publication to represent a global audience that makes up its readers, and he's delivered some of the most inspiring and diverse covers in the history of fashion. He approaches everything with an open heart and incredible authenticity, and he's made inclusiveness look effortless, and fashion has never looked better for it. All while proving one very important thing, that his approach and his worldview also leads to really good business. So Edward, thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for hosting this and convening this group of just powerhouse individuals today so we can talk about uh, the future of, of activism. Uh, as Edward mentioned, my name is Darnell Strom. I'm an agent and the head of culture and leadership at United Talent Agency, and I have the honor of moderating this dynamic group of individuals. The world is as chaotic and as and uncertain as it's been in our lifetime. So, you know, I want to start today with a little bit of hope and inspiration. Uh, so as I introduce each of our, our panelists, uh, I've asked them to just share very quickly you know, something that has given them hope or inspired them in the, in the last couple of weeks, weeks and shared that with them. Uh, so first I would like to start with uh, Janet Mock. Uh, Janet is a trailblazer. She's a New York Times bestselling author, an advocate and a writer, producer, director of the groundbreaking show Pose on FX. Uh, so Janet, thank you for being with us and would love for you to quickly share anything that has made you hopeful or inspired in the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm, I'm, first of all, I want to just thank you all for creating this space. Thank you for inviting me into it. Um, I think probably the thing that really was, I would say, life affirming for me was, you know, the protests that um, happened at Brooklyn Museum where 15,000 people showed up in white to defend and protect Black trans lives. I think for me, seeing that that um, protest and demonstration um, was organized by Black trans and queer people where, you know, obviously there was not 15,000 people in New York City who were all, you know, Black and trans, but, you know, the fact that these swarms of people showed up um, in a season where, you know, or not really a season, but a cycle where Black trans women aren't necessarily centered in most of our movements. It was uh, affirming, it was uh, life building, um, and it was deeply, um, deeply made me feel held and embraced in a way that allowed me to kind of go on and do, you know, the work that I do in the world to see that there's organizers um, out there um, centering. Thank you. Yara Shahidi. Hi, Yara. Uh, Yara is an actress, producer, and activist, and stars and executive produces Gronish on Freeform. Yara, do you want to quickly share something that has inspired you or, or made you hopeful in the last couple of weeks? Yeah, I, I think I similarly am grateful to be here. I really think about the action of my peers, and I think of my peer group who have been 
on the front lines, it's been absolutely inspiring to me um, to see how young people are leading the conversation. And then on a totally random note, a lot of Bob Marley has been playing in our house. And so that has continuously filled us up. That's always a good thing when Bob's playing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yara. Uh, Jesse Williams uh, is an actor, director, producer, entrepreneur, and an activist. Uh, you will notice that all of our guests are multi-hyphenates and they do so many things and we're, we get to benefit from, from all of the things that you guys do. So Jesse, uh, do you want to uh, let us know something that's inspired you or given you hope? Yeah, what inspires me right now is as a educator, as a former teacher, watching these monuments come down, not for the sake of the monuments as much, but because what's next is us re, um, retaking, recalibrating um, our educational system. The way history has been taught uh, is a foundational um, issue. And once we restructure that, it will um, totally change the posture of not only our community, but um, this nation and the world as a whole. When you're telling it backwards, um, it, it's what informs all of this. So once we tell it properly, um, people are going to be far less confused. Thank you. Virgil Abloh. Uh, Virgil is a designer, an artist, entrepreneur, and DJ. He's the founder and CEO of fashion label Off-White uh, and is also the artistic director of Louis Vuitton menswear collection. Virgil, thanks for being here. Do you want to share? No, thanks for having me. Janet, you said it best, you know, thanks for the space and allowing us to sort of occupy it. I think it's a great entry. And I think in the terms of hope, you know, two, two forms. One is that you know, collectively the world like switched off the idol switch. You know, like I think we were just sort of just going along when you think about 2019, 18, and obviously with such systemic issues, I'm glad that that switch just turned off. You know, I think that the, that moment allows for us to sort of pause and think, and we're still in that pausing moment. And then secondarily voice, you know, like just looking at this panel in itself, on a, a Vogue platform, just giving everyone voice, I think is super hopeful. Because without, without different people having a turn to speak, and especially during a time of this like global pause, I think is super hopeful to me that we'll end up with new results that sort of gain traction um, in a particularly precarious time. So, you know, I think it might be uncomfortable, but, to me, this whole sort of moment, even us coming together, gives me hope. Thank you, Virgil. Uh, Tamika Mallory has you know, 20 years uh, experience as a social justice leader, and she's an activist um, and has, has done many things, one of which uh, was one of the co-founders and former co-chair of the Women's March on Washington. So Tamika, thank you for being here with us. Would, would love to hear something that uh, quickly that has uh, inspired you or has given you hope recently. Thank you so much for having me. And I'm so excited to be among this group of people that I love and admire so much. Um, I, I would say I have to join Yara in saying that these young people have really inspired me. Uh, the courageousness that I have seen and just witnessed across the country as we've been traveling, as we've been out at protests and you know other um, important and impactful uh, engagements in the community, these young folks are extremely courageous and they push old people like me. I just turned 40 and so I'm now moving into a different group um, and they push us and you know, we learned a lot of respectability politics. And so from my perspective, you know, I'm like, hey, we can't say this, can't use certain words, we, you know, defund the police. How do you just say that? Like that's, a, it was a little scary in the beginning. These young people have helped me to understand that this is our moment um, and that we're not going to get anything done by just having hearings and meetings and conversations. But instead, look, someone loves me. They put a light on me over here. Um, but um, uh, they, they've been really saying we have to actually take our power in this moment. And it's going to be messy. It's going to be painful. Everyone's not going to understand it but we're going somewhere. We're heading in a, heading in a direction that is, is, is going to be historic and life-changing. And I'm just glad to be out here. Like I'm learning from them and just trying to provide as much support as possible without being the elder, if you will, in these spaces that sort of um, 
you know, challenges their creativity. I really want to see our young people grow and do all that they know they can do. And my job, I think our role is really to support them and to help try to put some bumpers on the side, but not to the point that they don't get an opportunity to be their best selves. So I would say definitely these young folks have made me feel really hopeful. Thank you. Uh, Patrice Colors is an artist, activist, author, and educator, uh, and she is also one of the co-founders of the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, Patrice, thanks for, for being here and would love to hear quickly something that has uh, inspired you or, or made you feel hopeful. Um, I, will, I just, it's so funny. It's like, we're all on this call and I feel very moved. I'm like, how do we talk? There's just amazing people. Everybody's incredible. Like, I feel like this is a, um, a family reunion on Zoom and I'm feeling very moved by this moment and opportunity. I think what has inspired me and made me feel the most hopeful in this moment is a global reimagining of public safety. Uh, for the first time in my lifetime, and I would argue in this country's um, since the end of slavery, we're having a different conversation about the role of police and a different conversation about the role of prisons. And it's a conversation that's actually um, a, a, a reckoning about what our communities have experienced. Um, the call for defunding the police, the call for abolition isn't a fringe call happening from the sidelines. It's actually the headlines. And that to me is, I never thought I would see that. I never thought that we would have a voice at the center to talk about something different when it comes to our safety. And so I'm incredibly moved and hopeful because of that. Thank you. Uh, and finally, my good friend, uh, Brittany Packnett Cunningham, uh, Brittany is a educator, an activist, uh, a leader, and a writer. She is also an NBC and MSNBC correspondent. Uh, Brittany, would love for you to, to, to share with us quickly. I think it's two things um, that are giving me hope. Actually, three, because one of them is most certainly this conversation, and it is such a blessing and a light today to be seeing the faces of friends and, and heroes alike. Um, I think the first thing really is discipline. That is giving me hope. I think for people who are not students of history and have not been in this work for a long time, it can feel as though this is a sudden moment, that this is a sudden breakthrough. But this breakthrough has been seeded for literal generations. And it was the abolitionists and the creatives and the thinkers and the activists and the writers and the movers and the people who were willing to be brave enough to imagine the world before we could get there that have brought us to this moment. Um, and that that takes a great deal of discipline. It takes a great deal of investment when it is not popular. And the fact that they could do that over time um, gives me uh, not only a great sense of gratitude, but a great sense of hope that we can, in fact, ensure that the seed breaks all the way through the ground and not be the generation of people that stands in the way of that light. Um, and I also think um, on the other end of what, what Tamika and Yara are saying, my elders are giving me hope. You know, here in the States, we lost C.T. Vivian and John Lewis, two incredible civil rights icons on within the same 24 hours. And as sad as all the folks in our community are because they touched us so deeply and they gave us so much wisdom, I recognize the fact that they got to be elders, which so many people who choose freedom work do not get to be. The fact that they moved their ego out of the way to invest in so many of us and took their responsibility as elders so seriously, the fact that they started this as young people and that the audacity of that youth and that courage carried them all the way through their lives and that they showed us how to practice courage as a discipline and not as something that is episodic or of the moment is something that is giving me deep hope, a deep sense of privilege, and most certainly a deep sense of responsibility to make sure that all of us are carrying the yoke as, as uh, they pass on and we continue. But as a person of faith, I feel like if God said that they could rest, that meant that we were ready to take up the mantle. And that's exactly what we're going to do. Right. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, all, all of you, uh, for that hope. We all, we all need it right now. So, look, I'm not going to spend a lot of time telling you or the audience that 2020 has been an unprecedented, critical, painful, crazy year. Uh, that none of us will forget. Uh, instead, I want us to focus this conversation on the on the future. You know, will we look back at this moment and talk about how it changed everything? Uh, will the new normal look eerily like the old normal? Will activism take on new shape? 
so we've all invited you guys here because you have unique perspectives on all of these on the, all of these questions. So you know our time is short and our group is is large and I've already talked too much. So let's just uh, jump right in. The, the first question that I have is about about storytelling. You know the power of of leveraging culture uh, and leveraging the the power of media and entertainment and the ability to tell stories. I think you are all storytellers in your your own ways, whether it be through your activism, whether it be through the brands that you've built or your acting, writing and producing, you know, have the events of 2020 changed the way you think about telling stories? And if so, how? I'm going to I'm going to throw it to you, Janet, first to to start the conversation. Um, You know, for me, I don't really think that the moment has uh, shifted how I tell these stories. Um, I think it just has made the work that I do and who I center just a bit more urgent. I think that, you know, I've been, you know, growing up just seeing, you know, shards of myself on screen, you know, and thinking about the products and things that I love so much, you know, just thinking about something as small as what Jesse did and, you know, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants too, like seeing this beautiful black man be centered in this beautiful way in this like mainstream movie, just something like that. And just wanting to see more of that with like, you know, Yara's presence presence on Grownish and that she helps craft that narrative and that she talks to those writers in the room telling them, you know, what, you know, she wants to see on screen for her character. And, you know, the urgency of that, the urgency of us not just, you know, being on screen, but telling our community stories, knowing that Patrice is in, you know, the writer's room of the bold type um, and knowing how important that show is for so many, you know, young people um, and folks, you know, like us who are approaching our forties, who still think that they're young people. Um, so yeah, you know, just the urgency for me, if anything, is is really what shifted. Thank you. Um, I, I want to bring in Yara and, and Jesse. You too. You know, you guys are all you know producers and and, and writers and, and creating content at this point. You know, how is this moment you know informed how you're going to approach future future content? And have you have you shifted? Uh, your approach and, you know, to Janet's point, is it even more critical and, and more timely for you to continue doing what you're doing on the kind of entertainment side of things? Yeah, I mean, really to just echo what Janet has said so beautifully, I think it has increased the urgency for me in terms of pushing these stories forward. And I feel like working in a producerial capacity, a lot of it has been, how do we support Uh, what's happening behind the scenes as what we're offering on screen. And so it has been fighting for writers. It has been redetermining what the studio system views as risk because we see the willingness of them to invest in other people. When you look at headlines of somebody being able to come in at 23 with, with no plot, no characters and get a show on HBO, that was oddly specific, but, um, I think it speaks to the way in which the term risk has been used against us for so long to ensure that we aren't able to populate our own shows the way that we want to um, or be in that imaginary space. And I often reflect on the fact that when I was 13, um, Catcher in the Rye was my favorite book. And there was something about that that spoke to my ability to see myself in whiteness to such an extent because it had been trained in that I could see myself in a book that had made no space for me, nor did it consider me in any way. And so there's something really beautiful about being in media right now in which we get to do, as James Baldwin said, create a world in which the the flag that you pledged allegiance to along with everybody else is actually for once pledging allegiance to you by paying attention and doing that work of centering. Yeah, I, you know, I think along those, those lines, it's, it's far less about does it change what I make or how I view it? It's really all about how, what, what, what Jenna and Yara were talking about is how we're received. We're actually still plotting our path forward. It's just about um, the white power's delusional structure, letting more, have, running out of excuses. This whole system is just a house of excuses and we just slowly chip away at them. You keep pretending we are not qualified, they are not ready, all these self-fulfilling, snake-eating-its-own-tail prophecies that are just nonsense, um, delusional myths with an agenda, and we just keep debunking them. One after the other, they said she couldn't, they said he couldn't, they said we couldn't, they said it wouldn't work, they said it wouldn't work, and it all worked, and it's all the most profitable and most compelling cultural material that exists. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it less it it so this, I think that lends itself to the urgency taking advantage of our opportunities, which is what African people have always done, right? Is alchemy, figuring out a way to make something out of an opportunity that nobody else would be able to survive on. 
Um, so, so that's the difference that I see now in storytelling is a, a couple less excuses that's getting closer to a meritocracy instead of a kind of gross nepotistic circle jerk. Um, so, so yeah, that, and, and watching us all be able to pounce on it and watch these incredible content creators actually thrive instead of this mediocre tra trash that's been out there for so long. I, I think one, I think one point that you raised, Jesse, that is, that is extremely important is not only being able to have the space to tell stories and have the powers that be historically who have kept our stories off screen because of risk and because of it might not sell, it might not work. I think not only debunking that, which we have shown, but I think it's also telling the story of those successes because you know I think sometimes people will call them anomalies and not make them the example. And I've had this conversation with yeah. Edward where they said, oh, you can't put a black person on the cover of the September issue of, of Vogue, of British Vogue, that'll, you know, that'll kill our sales. So he said, okay, I'll put Rihanna on the cover of my first September issue and it becomes their best selling issue in 20 years. You know, last year it was a tapestry of, 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 of women of all shapes, sizes, abilities, and colors. Yara was one of the people on the cover last year and it became their fastest selling issue of all time. Uh, you know, I think uh, this next September issue is going to be historic in its own way. And the business is supporting all of this. So I think telling the stories behind the successes is extremely important so that people, uh, so the money end, ends up following so we get those opportunities. Uh, I, I want to pull in some of our, our, our activists on, on the conversation about how they approach, uh, how they approach storytelling and has anything changed or, or evolved in this moment? Uh, I can, I can try to take that one you know it has been interesting the last uh six years since um the ferguson uprising uh, in my hometown we have found our ways into very different spaces than we originally anticipated <laughs> um and i think that we've all been trying to be deliberate and intentional with how we use those spaces for justice and not for not to serve ourselves um and i think that a lot of people came to know us through these movements and think that we were born in the movements as if we did not have interests experiences and um talents and gifts that we developed prior to the movements to lend to the movements um and this is a time where we are able i think to really hone a lot of those i spent a lot of time in prayer and thought and journaling and reflection and therapy about what my purpose is in life and i really believe it is to speak and teach truth that moves people to action so how do we leverage our ability and our gifts to tell stories in all of the places that equip people to go and do better work um, i think that we often are experiencing a lot of content creation that is much more focused on the creator hearing themselves talk or seeing themselves reflected in a way that is not of service to something larger than themselves. So if we are doing these things well, and so many of the folks on this panel are, people are leaving asking themselves better questions when they have experienced whatever story we've told. And they are doing the internal and external work to create justice in their circle of influence, right? So I'm, I watch Pose and I'm asking myself better questions. I watch Disclosure Doc as a cis woman, I'm, I, I'm asking myself better questions. I'm thinking about the conversations that I have and the stories that I help share and expose people to in my own immediate circle in the same ways that I would want somebody to do with the stories that I am telling. And creating that kind of multiplier effect is the power of story that yes, it humanizes. Yes, it explains. Yes, it educates, but most certainly it expands beyond the individual. And that is the power of storytelling that we're seeing coming from everywhere from the streets to the screen. I love that. Um, I'll piggyback and you know, I think one thing that an organizer is taught, um, although I, you know, I know everybody label this as activist, um, that's really a small part of, of what the big picture of what many of us do. I, I call myself a community organizer and I will until I die. That's what John Lewis was. That's what MLK was. That's what Ella Baker was. That's what Fannie Lou Hamer was. And, you know, as an organizer, the, the center of our work is telling a story. We are telling a story to, um, you know, local government, uh, state government, national government, um, not just to tell the story, we're telling it so that we can move people to action, so that we can actually change the material conditions for the people who are most under attack um, in um, any given moment. And so the stories that, that I'm telling, um, I wrote my memoir really begrudgingly 
and, and published it in 2018, not because I was so excited about writing a memoir, but rather um, our, our leadership and the people in our movement were being called terrorists. Um, we were under attack by white supremacists. We were under attack by um, people who deeply believed that we, we were harming the country. And so it was an intervention. Um, it was an intervention into a narrative uh, that the work that we were doing was dangerous work. Instead, what, we, what I tried to tell and what many of us are trying to tell as organizers is the work that we are doing is actually life-giving and life-affirming. Um, the work that we do every single day is a vision for Black life, not just in our survival, but so that we can thrive. And, um, and to close it is, is and I, I'll say this phrase until I die, which is when Black people are free, we all get free. It really is that simple. And so that is the story that I'm telling. And that's the story that we are collectively telling every time we go to a city council meeting, every time we go to a county board of supervisor meeting, every time we talk to the governor, every time we're talking to you know, national or federal government, we are telling these stories so we can change the material conditions for our family members. So I just want to say that I came here to listen to Brittany and Patrice preach uh, because that's what they do well. Uh, but, you know, I, and thank you. Both of you have said everything that I wanted to say. And that's also the problem with going behind your friends that know everything and they can say it all. Um, but I feel like from the beginning in 2016, when we started working on the Women's March until now, I've been telling stories every second of the day. We had to tell the stories to white women over and over and over again to help them to get to the place that we were at uh, January 21st, 2017, where people showed up. And we were very intentional by we. I have to make sure I, I uh, give love to my sisters, Carmen Perez and uh, Linda Sarsour. And when we first sat down at the table with these white women, we first started working together. It was like, well, what does race have to do with women's issues. That's sort of where we started. By the time we got to uh, the march, th some of them were more radical than us. Like at this point, Bob Bland, our partner, some days I'm like, Bob, don't say that. <laughs> you know, you, you, you're, too, you're too strong. Um, but it was radical work of storytelling, helping her to understand these issues, helping her to understand reproductive justice and gun violence and how those issues actually go together and, and you know, race and just so many things. And, and there were times when people would walk away from the Women's March and the New York Times made it a big issue that there were white women who said we were being divisive because we continuously talked about race. We continued to bring it up in every conversation. And we were like, okay, well, bye-bye, because we're doing this intentionally. We have to have these conversations right now. And it was a lot of storytelling. But that moment has happened again as of late. Because now we're having people who maybe they thought Donald Trump was the beginning and end of racism, and we weren't 100% able to sort of break that. We tried with the Women's March, but I think a lot of people still were like, Trump is my enemy. Trump is my enemy. Until they watched George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, and now they know about the murder of Breonna Taylor. And once again, we're having a moment when people are sitting at our feet saying, tell me why this is happening and tell me what I'm missing. I know I feel something in my heart. I want to show up. I want to be a part of this movement, but I, I don't understand all the details. And yet again, we find ourselves telling stories. And I have to just be honest and saying, sometimes it's freaking exhausting. It's exhausting to have to start at a, recommend the books, help people know, you know, what to do, where to look, where to go, who they need to be following. But I also can see transformation. And when I watch folks in Portland, in a large group, the way that we saw just yesterday, stand together, screaming Black Lives Matter up against literal tyranny, literal terrorism that's happening on their streets where whatever this special group of, of I don't know what you call them, y'all have, they're terrorists as far as I'm concerned, that are there to prevent protesters for standing up for what they believe in and for standing up for justice. And I see 
people of all different shapes, sizes, races, beliefs coming together to say Black Lives Matter, I know that the storytelling we're doing is not in vain and that our exhaustion is for a great cause. Well said. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like there can be a, a whole separate conversation with this group about dealing with the exhaustion, especially the first few weeks after George Floyd, how many, I, I realize, I always joke with some people, I realize just how many white friends I had in that moment because my phone was blowing up. Everyone asking every question, what can I read? I'm like, well, I can't also be in pain and help you with your grievances too. But anyway. Um, I wanted to put together a book of all the texts we've surely received. Yes. Yeah, by the way, that's not, that's not a bad trade. idea. Yeah. It's a coffee table anthology. book. Yeah. Right. Uh, I, I, I want to transition to, you know, I think we're in this moment and I'm, all, I'm very interested about the, the changing expectations and responsibilities of people with an elevated platform. Um, and, you know, do we think that activism is your responsibility if you have that that type of that type of platform, or is it something extracurricular that you that you do? And should everyone with a platform be expected to to be involved in this movement? And you know, Virgil, I want to bring you into the to the conversa conversation because you know I, I think your your role in, in fashion is you know in the way that you've ascended to the levels that you've ascended to is is historic. Uh, you know, there there hasn't been. A, a, a black person who has been the uh, artistic director of one of the, the major fashion houses before. And, you know, I think, I think what you have been able to, to do in, in those positions uh, is, is pretty incredible, but what is the responsibility that you feel to not only make sure you're doing a great job uh, in, in your kind of creative role, uh, but also to making sure that you are connected to activism and things that are going on in the, in the, in the streets and just social justice in general? Yeah, 100%. You know, the thing that I'm completely disappointed with in my space, and I love hearing the stories about film, media, community organizing, because we're dividing and conquering. You know, each one of these boxes is like pointed in a different direction. In my space, within fashion or the, the media industry that is fashion or the projection of beauty, or projection of talent as a designer, I'm completely disappointed with the lack of diversity in my space. You know, Edward and I sit in a in a very in a very space that's you know we are the hyper minority, and I'm just specifically in terms of ownership. You know, in terms of like what do we own as Black people in the space of this industry that's a mirror of the world. And obviously we know things are profitable or we know things are sort of pop culturally relevant by, by our own sort of manufacturing and projection. So as a designer, you know, I can only speak for myself to your exact question is like responsibility. It's my life goal. My goal in life isn't to make fashion. You know, that's, that's beneath, that's not, that's a system that came from another train of thought that that we didn't own you know my goal is to to showcase what b black people of of all descent and who identify themselves can do and we should own that you know so i stand before the world as you know i started from a screen printed t-shirt and they told me that i wasn't a fashion designer and i didn't take that assessment as fact because they made it up you know and so as i charged through the idea was to sort of make these milestones so that I could be a figurehead for ownership. You know, I started off white. I own that. It sits on a schedule that's not diverse and I'm the minority in that space. But I think by, by leading by example, my activism is embedded into sort of this, uh, this framework that, that exists on a pop culture scale to open up doors for others. So my activism portrays itself in a number of ways that to me is to make systemic change within an industry that's not set up for people like myself. But my whole goal since the beginning was to open up doors and keep them open for, for other black young kids that have uh, maybe formal training or none to exist in the same space that I do. And how important is you know, I think I think we're living in a in a very interesting time, and we'll we'll talk about you know kind of call out culture and and people wanting to to hold others publicly accountable and using social media and how that can sometimes then go off the rails and turn into something very different. But 
you know, the, the stuff that you've been working on, you know, some folks may not have known, you know, how important is it to, to publicize, or is, is it a part of the responsibility to kind of publicize the work that you're doing, whether you're doing it behind the scenes or, or you're, you're very public with it? I know it just kind of depends on people's uh, uh, approach, but, you know, has, has, have these times changed your opinion on how public facing you want to be about the, the, the work that you're doing? For me, it's important not to change who you are under any circumstances, you know, like whoever, whatever to all the people, like there's no, you don't grow up one day with a, a chip or a book that teaches you how to be an activist. You know, it teaches you how to apply activism within your work. I, I believe in the sort of varied voices, but for me in my own practice, you know, especially within fashion and seizing this moment of now, like the volume can go up. You know, I think when the volume's low, you don't know what song is playing. You know, you don't know exactly if it's, if it's uh, you know, this artist or the Bob Marley or if it's Buju Benton, you know, if it's low enough. But I think what, what this, like the first question you asked, the hopeful time is that any, we can turn the volume to 12 on everything, on all levels. And I love what Brittany said about, you know, we, we don't think that we're, we came from a meteor that just hit earth, um, you know, 10 weeks ago. Like this is off of our forefathers who've been telling this story and trying to sort of advance it for a long period of time. So uh, for me, you know, the, the criticism that we will all face inevitably by bringing these voices louder or the misunderstanding, not one person is uh, impervious to being misunderstood. That, that sort of comes with having a loud voice. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're in a place to, to make this urgent. I think urgent is the best word that Janet used. It's like, this has to happen at rapid pace now and to be effective and efficient. Jesse, I, want, I wanted to bring you in on this. Um, you know, four years ago, you gave that powerful speech when you accepted the Humanitarian Award at the, at the BET Awards. And in that moment, I went back and watched it again yesterday. And it's like you could have given it you know, today, it's the, I mean, the, the words are so relevant. You literally, you know, if, if someone played it for a person that hadn't seen it before, you would think that it came out, came out today. And at the time that you made that speech, some found it controversial. And we've talked in the past of, you know, has that affected you professionally in some ways? Has that, you know, hurt opportunities and, and, and helped you? But, you know, you did feel a responsibility in that moment to, to, to use your voice. So can you tell us a little bit about that and, and, and what that journey has been like over the last few years? You know, yes, sure. It's the but that's that's the cost um, uh, to be in this in this game. Yeah, there's there's been sure there's uh, plenty. It has not helped. There are plenty of things that it has gotten the way of. There are plenty of jobs that I have earned that I have lost. Um, but that's part. Of, that's that's the way it goes. You know, this it's not a uh, that doesn't really factor into the equation. We have work to do. We have a purpose here, um, and we live in service to our community and to a better future. So whatever. You, they've always been throwing things back at us and putting obstacles are part of the game or else we would already be at the finish line. Um, and, and also the biz, the obstacles in, in show business, that's a, that's a finger on the hand of my life. It's not, it doesn't really have anything to do with my life. There are 20 other things we can do and we'll continue to do whether you take away the studio job or not. Um, and I'm super, you know, lucky to be supported and buoyed in many other ways. So uh, yeah, that was earlier than this, but again, it was just, it's just exposing, confronting, you know, white delusion needs to, you know, it's that person in your life that like when you corner them, they will keep scratching. They need to be f forced to the food to show them none of the excuses will work. It's real. We're not imagining it. It's not a figment of our imagination. It's not hyperbolic. It didn't just happen to me. It's not because of what she was wearing. You, they'll contort themselves into every shape to possibly avoid any kind of culpability. Um, so we just have to keep pressing on. All you can do is stay calm and keep moving forward. And sometimes you don't have to stay calm. Um, so, so that you know, that's just yeah, that's that's part of the game. But now, as you see the business now reaching out and embracing and acting like they're encouraging the very behavior that I've literally been black blackballed out of. Uh, or, or four, I should say, um, that is, I mark, I review that as progress. That is now a new opportunity. It's the, um, because we're just being consistent 
that's all you can do is be consistent and be authentic and make sure that you are doing work. You asked before about uh, an obligation, I think, for celebrities in terms of activism. Uh, I don't believe that anybody, just because they have an incredible gift from God to sing, has any more of an obligation to be uh, a responsible member of our community than a plumber. Um, however, we do, as folks with platforms, have an obligation um, not to get in the way, mm. not to run your mouth and, and block our blessings, block the work of these people that incredible sacrifices are being made for. Because just like what we're seeing with other popular figures, sometimes there is this kind of Columbus mentality that is con that has uh, been contagious in our community as well as just because you discovered something new, just because you just heard some new fact, just because Candace Owens just pumped some bullshit into your ear, doesn't mean you get to start blasting it out as if it's true. There are people that are living, breathing, dying and bleeding for this. And just because you showed up doesn't mean you discovered anything. So be humble enough to look inward. All of our answers are in our community. They are not outside of our community, I promise you. So, so that, that I hope is just a pattern that people can look and absorb from each one of the people on this call. And there is, uh, no matter what you are wondering about, there are answers available for you with love. This is a love movement. This, they keep, it's all opposite world. They try to tell you it's about hate. It's all about our love for ourselves and each other. It can't nothing stop that. Thank you. I just, I want to transition uh, quickly to you know something I just touched on uh, a bit and want to dive into it a, a bit more and you know we're talking about these times of being held publicly accountable and how uh, you know social media has a way of being able to to call out people you know but I also want to want to know that when does that go too far and you know when do we when do we cross the line and I think sometimes maybe public figures might be you know a little concerned of of when and how to speak up because it it might turn into something that isn't isn't uh, constructive and and becomes uh, destructive in some ways. So you know, one, Virgil, I want to bring you back in on this because you know I think most recently you've you've had a, a bit of a dust up and have, have kind of been on the receiving end of, of of some of this. I know that you know some folks were were, were uh, you know uh, critical of you because of of a donation that you had posted that they didn't feel was an, enough money. Which I know there's a backstory to that, which would love for you to explain a bit more. And then also too, you kind of being critical of uh, about some of the looters. Uh, that hit stores that were connected to friends of yours and organizations that you had been been tied to. So yeah, I would love to hear from you, you know, if you had to do it all over again, what would you have done differently in that situation? And, and have you learned anything from all of this? And, and, and how are you moving forward from it? Well, you know, I think the thing of social media is it takes such a snapshot and it sort of gives, it gives, it gives a platform for people to just to pick and choose. It's not the platform for true understanding. So misunderstanding will always come from sort of social media, like a 130 characters. But at the end of the day, my feelings, you know, I wouldn't change anything in my life. Otherwise I wouldn't be on the Zoom here. But my standings still say the same, you know, property is not, doesn't have a higher value than this message. That's for fact, you know, there's nothing that, that stands in the way of this message being delivered that we're culturally rising to the top. Um, you know, again, I said, it's like, I'm fighting for black ownership within the space of fashion. You know, I own businesses that, again, that were, are fine to sort of be sort of pushed towards the cause. Um, you know, and ultimately, like my actions are my resume. And I think something that Jesse said and sort of is super resonating with me. Before the topics and the lights are on these exact issues, my whole career has been to sort of be a figurehead and role model for other black people to be in the space of fashion and to own it, you know, own businesses, own, own their brands, own their IP. Um, so, you know, that work for me won't stop. You know, I announced just three weeks ago, a million dollar scholarship to put black students through fashion school to, to sort of follow in my path. And that's, that's me going to all the companies that I work with and saying, hey, we need to turn the volume up because it might be misunderstood by me. You know, I'm actually more of like a, a sort of more shy person, but my activism, even through shyness, can be uh, at million dollar uh, or monetary amounts that speak about my true intention. And, you know, I think it's all about it's for me and my community of young designers who aspire to be in fashion or make sneakers like I see behind you 
that Michael Jordan put in our ether. It's like, we need to get those opportunities and more young people need to follow, be able to follow my path without the headaches and without the, I love how Jesse put it, you know, like the, the, the if and the buts, maybe it won't, you know, it's like, I, I don't take it lightly, you know, I'm out here showcasing my activism in, in ways that, you know, I think are, can systemically combat the, the, the sort of uh, sidebarring that happens within our industry. Thank you. And by the way, uh, Virgil, we're all going to DM you our shoe sizes because I think <laughs> those new uh, off-white Jordans uh, and they are fresh. So uh, <laughs> it's my honor. <laughs> that's, so, you, that's so funny. My son calls me in the, in the morning. It must have been six o'clock. Mike, you have to get up right now. You've got to get online. You have to get your credit card ready. I need these. <laughs> <laughs> but they're for us and they're by us you know that's to me it's like i want your son to be a designer with me like i would love to have him as an intern on a new project that i'm working with so that he gets the education to make those shoes one day and like i'm I, it might sound like i'm saying it casually but that's that's the exciting thing and i'm so inspired by the voices in your own industry it's like that's the least and that's the first idea is like we own it we're designers don't know if I could if I could yeah. add something really quickly though because I think we keep using this word of activism and we're not defining it like Patrice I'm an organizer but I'm also a, a teacher like I'm a public educator I started in a third grade classroom so whenever you start the lesson you have to define what you're talking about and I think that when we talk about activism in whatever space we are applying there are a couple of questions we have to ask ourselves to make sure we're actually defining it correctly the first question is is it an activity or is it a performance right a performance feeds your ego and activity provokes action from people so wherever you are doing your activism and has to actually provoke action for the sake of justice broadly, right? Whether it is fashion, it is film, television, it's on the streets, on the screen, wherever it is. The second is that it has to actually provide real oppositional force. So Beverly Tatum, who used to be, she's an education researcher. She's the former president of Spelman College, a black uh, college for black women in Atlanta, Georgia. She talks about the, the idea of a moving walkway, right? You know, those in the airports that we used to go to when we were off punishment. You, when you're on a moving walkway, you have to actually provide oppositional force to change the direction of the moving walkway. Our systems, structures, institutions, and culture are automatically moving in the direction of white supremacy. That is the intended direction that they were built, right? If you are going to actually engage in activism, you can't simply stand still on the moving walkway because you're still moving toward the intended end. You can't turn around because you may be facing a different direction, but your body is still moving toward the intended end. You can't even just walk slowly toward the opposite end. You actually have to run as quickly as possible in the opposite direction and recruit as many people as you can to run with you because that's the only way that you actually create oppositional force that changes the intended direction of the systems, cultures, and institutions, right? So it, activism has to be an intentional oppositional force. The last thing is recognizing that this culture of white supremacy is a smog meaning that whether you benefit from it or it harms you, you breathe it in. And so we have to make sure whether we are folks who are oppressed, are privileged or some combination thereof, that we are not perpetuating the very same oppressions that we have suffered because we've been breathing them in. So it is all of our job to read the books and do the work and do the learning to breathe out the smog of white supremacist, heteronormative patriarchy culture and actually breathe in radical imagination in the service of justice so that we don't replicate those systems that harmed us and then we project them onto somebody else. So that is all about, yes, being accountable, doing the learning, making sure that you are growing and learning in public and in private, but that's what activism really means. And if you are applying that wherever you are, then you're doing the work. Hmm. Deaconess Packnett Cunningham coming with the preaching that Tamika was talking about. Um, I, I wanna bring in uh, Brittany, Patrice, and, and then Yara on, on a question about, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about the future, but I want to talk about the near future, which there is the most critical election in the history of, of this country, in my opinion, definitely in any of our lifetimes. And it seems like that statement is said every election. Uh, it, I don't think it's ever been more true than, than this moment that we're in, uh, we're in right now. 
and you know uh, to our to our community organizers to our educators who are on the uh, in the conversation and Patrice and, and Brittany this energy that we've seen this the movement the protest so many allies and co-conspirators coming together to, to join this movement that you know we've been fighting for for many 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 decades centuries I love the energy my do you think what's the what's what's next do you think that this same energy is going to be sustained at the ballot box on on, on November 3rd and how do we channel that to make sure that the turnout amongst the demographics of people who are out there who are historically the least likely to vote are actually turning out and turning this movement into a political outcome that can help us start restructuring the uh, the, the institutions and the laws and the policies that uh, that are that have been oppressing us I can start I, I want to um, also, thank you, Brittany, for really clarifying and grounding us in this conversation around what is activism, what is organizing. Um, I'll say this. Um, I've been sorely disappointed uh, in the last seven years in the onset of Black Lives Matter and the conversations around elections um, because um, we act as if we vote and then it changes everything. That's not actually how voting works. Um, we have to Vote, yes, I've voted since I could vote. I grew up Jehovah's Witness and that's a religion where people don't vote. So when I got out of that religion, I was really grateful to be able to have the opportunity to vote. So that was always something I felt really intimately. But as a young person, um, uh, as 18, 19, 20 year old, um, the options around who we voted for, what we voted on was always sorely disappointing. And so I wanna start there because I don't demonize the uh, the, the community of activists who say they don't want to vote. And in fact, I, I try to have a different conversation, which is what is the strategy? Um, what is the long-term strategy? I do believe that we need to get Trump out of office. So I want to say that. I believe we need to get Trump out of office and part of doing that is voting. But Trump, as Tamika said earlier, is not our only enemy. Um, the enemy is actually the large systems of white supremacy that we are all entrenched inside of. And we actually have to tr transform and, and show up and change the course. And part of that is voting, but it's not the only part. Um, part of that is um, organizing, showing up every day inside of your industry, changing it, transforming it. Um, part of that is challenging local government. Uh, we also have local elections happening. I get to vote for a different district attorney in Los Angeles County, a, dis a different district attorney that isn't Jackie Lacey. I'm so excited about that. Many of us are excited about that. Um, we have mayoral elections. I mean, there's so many avenues around how we could talk about the elections that I think it's really important to have a much broader conversation. I, I do understand the historicity of this moment but I think it, it really flattens the conversation when we only talk about getting Trump out. I think we have to have a fuller conversation around organizing our own strategy because I promise you that yes, we may get Trump out in November, but on that next day, we will have to be in a fight with the next president. <laughs> um, that's just the nature of what happens living inside of the belly of the beast. So I don't want people to feel like we vote we get Trump out and the work is over because that's not true. We vote, we get Trump out, and then we keep working. We keep working towards justice. We keep working towards love. We keep working towards peace. We keep working towards transformation. And that's the conversa conversation I want to be having with my peer group and younger folks and elders in our movement. I, I think that's uh, an important distinction. Um, you know, in November is about way more than, than Trump. I, I do think that it gives us an opportunity to handle the Trump situation, but also talking about voting up and down tickets, talking about district attorneys, attorney general races. These are a lot of roles and positions that the common voter didn't even really think about who they were voting for. You know, on paper, you're like, oh, LA has a black district attorney. We should be good, right? And, and then you look at what that attorney, district attorney is advocated for, and you're like, no, we're not good. So I, I think it is important that not just voting, but continuing to be a part of that of that system that is yes voting to organizing and holding the people that we're voting for accountable which is an ongoing conversation and the third thing too to your point is making sure that we have people that are representative of, of us running for office and you know i think one of the outcomes of, of 2018 which i'm sure tamika could have, could have spoken about is that when the women's when the women's march hit it created this groundswell 
um, that, that continued through uh, November 2018, which we saw an unprecedented number of women elected to office, and not just in Congress, but up and down from state, local, beyond, and an unprecedented number of Black women, women of color, uh, you know, elected into to office. And that's going to be an ongoing, uh, an ongoing conversation and an ongoing strategy. And it's not just about voting once because it is not a, a silver bullet. So thank you for, uh, for, for breaking that down. Um, and, you know, actually, Yara, I want to I pull you in on this because I know you've been working a lot around, around this issue, especially mobilizing Gen Z and, and your peers who are such a critical, incredible group of people that have been, when I was at the protest in, in LA, one of the things I looked around and said, I'm the old ass dude in the room now, you know, it's like, you know, the, the, the amount of young energy that, that was out there. What are you hearing from, from your peers about this moment and about November and beyond? Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, first and foremost, I, I think I just have to say thank you to what Patrice and Brittany have so beautifully offered to ground the conversation, because even from the point of view of just as a young person, I've always personally labeled as just a socially engaged human, um, knowing that there is work for me to do to continue to be active, and I still want to push in in the right direction. But when I look at the voting space as a whole or why I was involved in it in the first place, um, I've similarly felt it important to ensure that in this conversation, we're not saying like, vote and you're good. Like everyone get together, we're all gonna vote, the world's gonna be a better place. Because I think there is a very real history beginning or even with reconstruction being a monumental part of it in which voting became um, integrationist, no matter which way you, you were able to vote or no matter what strategy you took, because it was still a matter of working within a very finite system that has been built for white supremacy. And so I think um, the reason that I've been active in the conversation about voting has been, okay, this is one of the many tools that we have. And at the same time, it is not the only form of civic engagement, nor is it the only form of civic engagement that you should take up in. But when I'm looking at my peer group, what I love is the fact that they are able to actually hold these many truths. So I see my peers able to have the conversation about what it means to genuinely be radical in a way in which we're not just merely supporting a system um, and at the same time still be engaged to vote. And so really having this uh, two-pronged kind of intent of saying, okay, I'm gonna go vote. I know for me, voting in the most recent primary was exciting exactly for the uh, reason that Patrice was talking about, but Reform LA Jails had a measure on there. And so I remember going to the polls motivated by the fact that that was what I was voting on. And in turn, it inspired me to figure out the rest of where I landed in all of these policy decisions. But it also very much had a tangible um, moment in which I said, okay, I'm voting on this, but what am I doing next? I'm voting on this, but what is my next action after that? And so um, I think voting has been a great space for my peers to begin the conversation on civic engagement and then to extend it to what does civic engagement look like as a daily practice? What does it look like as something that is fully sustainable? And I quite honestly always talk about, I feel like it is a myth about the apathetic Gen Z person. I really don't know a person in my peer group who doesn't care. There may be some people that are misguided. <laughs> there may be some people where you have to, um, I, I think, uh, do some work in making sure that they have the curricula around them to ensure what's happening in the world. But in terms of the larger conversation that I think we've been distracted by of like, how do we get young people to care? I don't know a person that doesn't feel deeply affected by this. I, I mean, I, I was born into a dystopian world and I was born into a world in which we didn't even have the myth of utopia to, to distract us. We didn't even have the tangible feeling of hope. I think some of the most radical work that I've had to partake in is what does it mean to feel hopeful in a time like this, to make this sustainable? And so I say all of that to say, um, voting has been an important space, I think for me, partially just as an entry point to conversation and as an entry point to being able to get people who fall in different works of climate change, et cetera, immigration rights, to be in the same space to talk about what does it mean to bridge the gap between these spaces because they are all one cohesive space that work together. Thank you. So, so Janet, one of the one of the questions I wanted to to direct towards you is that as we've seen this conversation grow about Black Lives Matter and this this movement grow and, and swell, there's so many other groups that have been marginalized that have been that been have been oppressed whose movement hasn't gotten the attention that it deserves and does, hasn't gotten the attention that it, that it needs. I know that you've been such a strong advocate for, uh, for trans rights and, you know, specifically around, um, you know, the lives of black trans women who were murdered at 
an astonishing rate. Um, have you seen anything that makes you hopeful about some of the attention, there needs to be more, but some of the attention that has been focused on um, the importance of trans lives in, in, this, in this moment? Yeah, you know, the first thing I always say is that, you know, Black trans and queer people have always been here. We've always been engaged in movement work uh, for our own liberation and the liberation of our communities. Black trans and queer people come from Black communities. You know, we have parents who are Black who love us, who have raised us. We have siblings who are Black who love us and raise us. And so just as, you know, we come out and we fight, you know, uh, for our own lives, we are also fighting for the lives of our siblings. And I think that right now, what I am hopeful about is that Black organizers, Black creatives, Black activists of all shapes, sizes, colors, abilities are coming together um, to really coalesce our, uh, our focus around all Black lives, right? And so in that sense, you know, um, I'm incredibly hopeful by that, by that, um, that you know, bridge building that has been going on, that work where um, you know black trans folk are calling in black cis folk, and we're having conversations together, conversations about violence of all forms, not just state violence, but also violence within our communities, um, and how do we hold each other close, but also accountable to that work? Um, and so I'm always invested in doing that work. Uh, the reason why you know I've told my own story through my books and also through Pose um, was to show that we are part of the Black tapestry of storytelling, of love, of family, of community. And you know, some of the most ingenious, um, resilient people are Black people. And it's no um, coincidence to me that the ballroom community was created by Black folk who are pushed out of every single other space. And they came together and still created culture that has been taken, you know, and recycled and made, you know, all this other stuff by white creatives in Hollywood and all that. But at the end of the day, it is our struggle, um, our deep rootedness in black community and tradition of storytelling that has enabled us to be seen and heard um, as we are today. And that makes me hopeful. Well, thank you for all that you do. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of everything. I've read both of your books. Uh, I watch Pose and I'm just so excited about you know, all that you have coming through your Netflix deal. And uh, we can't wait to continue to see what you create and continue to advocate for. So, so thank you for all that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been an incredible conversation. I think just getting all of you dynamic, powerful people together to discuss this issue is an honor. And so thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And thank you for your time, your activism and your wisdom. As we wrap, I want to throw it to each of you to complete this sentence for us. 2020 is the year that. Okay, 2020, I think, is the year of, and to take uh, even the words of Tamika, of radical imagination. I feel like white supremacy, it's been a large conversation that it has um, taken away the space of the Black imaginary. And I love being in these rooms in which I feel as though we all have our work and at the same time, we're all creatives. We're all partaking in some form of imagination because we're about to have to build a world. It's not even rebuilding because we haven't seen it before. I'm excited to get the re out of there because we're just building and just imagining at this point. 2020 is a year that Black lives became worth fighting for. 2020 is the year that we came for everything that's ours, every single thing, the ownership, the lives, the thriving, the beauty, the creation, the joy, all of it. You know, how could you not, like, that's what the beauty of this community conversation is. You know, and this is what I want to see more of. It's bringing these voices together. We're resonating and, you know, literally, like, vibrating a, a sustained message higher in everyone who's listening. And like Yara and Brittany said, everything. You know, we don't have to put it in boxes or we don't have to sort of siphon it off to say, that it's like imagination and everything. I, I, there's nothing more... You can add because we deserve it all. Uh, 2020 is the year of awakening for some, but I think a sharpening of the tools for others. Uh, I think, you know, really piggybacking on what Yara was saying about imagination. I think that it's, uh, you know, a year of, you know, Black creatives creating Black visions for our future. Jesse, take us home. 
2020 is the year of confrontation. I think Yara mentioned Bob Marley earlier. It's a great title of one of his great albums. And by confrontation, I mean not only what would what you would think of as kind of oppositional force, something that feels aggressive or violent, but also just us being confronted with the realities of others, considering the feelings and lived experiences of others. This is something we have to deal with in personal relationships from COVID, whoever you're trapped in the house with, you have to confront yourself and and those who you share space with. Um, and that keeps the ripple effect of that outside of your circle and larger um, circles in your surroundings. And it's global. Um, so we are seeing nations gather all over the world um, in defense of to raise up, to lift up, to listen to and confront the experiences of folks that look, feel and live lives that are different from them. Um, so, and, and being confronted with our own foibles and flaws and aggressions and acts of violence against others, whether it's conscious or not, it doesn't mean it doesn't bleed. So we're, so we're getting uh, confronted from all angles, uh, personally, professionally, publicly. Um, and across uh, cultural lines and so-called racial lines. So confrontation is um, the reality check that we're experiencing in 2020. I think 2020 was the year of awakening for a lot of people, even folks who thought they were in the movement didn't necessarily know what they were moving towards to Brittany's point. Um, and I think that 2020 has been the year where people have actually found their work found their voice they have found their moment and they now they now are beginning to see what this collective response to white supremacy and oppression is all about um and 2020 is definitely the year for me um where it's been it's been sweet it's been bitter and sweet at the same time um people have been hurt people have been harmed but people have also been um jolted and and i am i'm i'm grateful for even through the pain i'm grateful for 2020. so for me 2020 is the year that the world turned upside down and it is the moment that folks got off the bench and started participating and i think and i hope by the end of this that though the the world is turned upside down we will come out of it in a positive place. And that upside down is gonna be our new right side up. Thank you. I wish everyone a safe, healthy, and powerful rest of your year.